Hi, and welcome to Inspire Me with Jay. I'm your host, author and teacher, Jay Spillers, and this is our very first episode. I have my guest, Troy Farr, who's going to talk about his journey in meditation. Welcome, Troy. Hello. Thank you for having me. Sure. So what... Uh, what, when did you start becoming interested in meditation? I was introduced really into meditation and became interested most probably when I was 16, but I was introduced to it probably at the age of around eight years old when my parents were into it. My parents had begun to study meditation and began to teach me, um, take me to classes, things like that. So... Your, uh, and I became interested probably like six, at 16, when mm -hmm. I was six, 16 years old. So I started reading a lot about it and started practicing it. And then um, from there is um, as a teen, just kind of reading and practicing it on your own. And then um, going into groups and um, meditating in different classes. What got your parents interested in meditation when you were eight? That's a very good question. I think that they just had some interesting experiences. You know, um, they were having some kind of like my mother was having some kind of psychic type experiences. And I think that it kind of led them into his path. And they, um, within, within that kind of field was meditation. And they started learning about that. And then I, um we go to there's like like there's a uh, a church called unity church mm -hmm. which is still around and that was kind of big in phoenix back in the early 80s yeah i've heard of the unity church and so what kind of psychic experiences was she having okay one time we were traveling out in the desert and we were, I was probably only about, about that age, about six to eight. I don't remember. I can't remember it though. And we're out in a motel in the middle of the desert. And um, when we're out in the pool. And my mother had this impulse. We got to you know, return quickly. There's danger or something. And all the money that my, first of all, that my family had had was kind of hidden in this hotel room. And it was being robbed. And as we're going up, they, you know, the robbers fled. And um, so was, I guess that was kind of like, she, she kind of felt that was going to happen. And they had some other experiences that didn't really, you know, explain all of it to me, but there were some other ones. So when she started to meditate, did she feel like she was connecting to God or to the spirit that, that uh, was giving her psychic abilities? Yeah, she was actually interested in pursuing her psychic abilities. So that was kind of like how she would go into it. When I got into it, it's more like the um, Eastern philosophy. And that today, I'm probably more into like Zen meditation or Vipassana. And but she was kind of into like the chakras and, you know, um, kind, of, kind of like healing, causing effect being able to have expanded awareness of things. Did she go on to heal people or use those uh, abilities? Yeah, I don't remember. Um, she was, she wanted, uh, and it was a long time ago. Um, I'm not sure. Actually, I mean, honestly, I mean, she, she had a lot of interesting ideas. She used to teach me that um, dreams are more important than reality. So she had a very interesting perspective of things. Mm -hmm. So when you say that you got interested, you were interested in the Eastern philosophy. Um, what specifically was of interest to you? I've taken different classes and read different books. And so in a lot of introduction of um, you know, meditation classes, you kind of get 
gave uh, gave you kind of a, a, a brief taste of all these different kinds of meditations. And I was always, even uh, even at 16, the books I read was Zen, um, a simple breathing meditation, Zen, um, by Passiona. Um, I tried the other ones too. Um, I like what you were saying. I heard you earlier on another podcast talking about once you listen to enough teachers, you can just kind of go on your own. Mm-hmm. I, I, I do a lot of body awareness now. Stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So what is like, uh, do you meditate on a regular basis? Yes. Right now, how I meditate is because I'm, um, I'm recovering from surgery. And so the muscles in my legs are having to recover and my body is muscles that have an issue so i'm using <clears throat> i'm using meditation as a kind of therapy and a kind of medicine and i've always have kind of approached it a little bit like it can be used as a therapy and medicine so what i'm using it right now is to create an awareness with your my body is so when you feel like pain it's a, you know these are messages from your body every day um i have to take these hot salt water epsom salt baths so that my muscles can relax or I'll still, you know, it'll hurt. Um, as I go through, the, and so when I do that, I have a whole ceremony where I'll put the lights down as, uh, and have I uh, put on certain music, like um, very calming music. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a YouTube channel called Calm Well, I want to recommend you put that on. Okay. And um, it, it, it's or a can. I put a, a little candle, and then um, I, and then when you get into the water, you just kind of like you 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 look for the pain, become aware of it. Um, I'm I'm having to something I can I, I learned how to do. You can you know how you you can make a muscle contract. Mm-hmm. using your mind you can tell your bicep to contract and so but there are also you have to teach your mind to tell your bicep to relax and that's something that so when i'm stretching for example mm-hmm. and and um, i can focus on in on that muscle on that group and think about it and make it relax does that make any sense yeah and i had actually mentioned in in my book about uh how People have used it for chronic pain and severe pain to sort of reduce the pain level. And I've never really had chronic pain or severe pain, but sometimes like if you have a body ache or if I have a headache, you know, when I do my meditation, I'll uh, sort of use it to relieve the pain. Like you can focus on, you know, relieving the stress in your head if you have a headache or something like that. So I've kind of used it a little bit for pain management when I've had pain. So yeah, I can relate to what you're saying. So you use it for pain relief. I have another story for you. So um, while you were saying that, I just remember, because I just use it in daily life. I don't really mention it to people. So it's kind of fun to talk to you about this. But yeah. when I'm in the dentist, I use it. And I use a simple breathing exercise. Usually I just count the, my breaths to four. You know, going, one, two, you know, I have a normal breath cycle and rate and just count your breaths up to four and just focus really and you get you you learn you get discipline to do it you get better and better at it you can focus in on your breath so much and so that when the dentist is drilling your teeth i don't feel the anxiety because i'm just so i'm not i'm I'm not even almost not there i can kind of put myself into almost a trance that's pretty cool so it's like the meditation can help reduce the physical pain but it can also help reduce pain caused from anxiety about the physical pain. This is kind of cool. Yes. Yeah. I've heard stories of people being hypnotized and not having pain and being able to do things like that with dental work. I've heard stories. I don't know. So, uh, so how long do you usually meditate in in a, a given day? Do you meditate like twice a day, once a day? How long do you usually meditate? Usually just um, once a day. So when I'm in the bath, I'll. My, this is what practice I'm just simply doing right now. I will start counting my breaths. 
And I'll do that for just a, any period of time. I don't really count it, but I used to have really structured meditations. But I just become, um, this, I just keep trying to get my body to relax and you can get it to calm down. I'm interested in, in a uh, person, you ever heard of Wim Hof? Who's, they, they call him the Iceman. I haven't heard of him, no. Um, he is, uh, we'll talk about him sometime in the future. He's um, somebody who puts himself in doing the same thing. He puts himself into a kind of uh, meditation and he is so focused and he puts himself into ice water. He's, he lives in Northern Europe and he just puts himself out there in ice water. He's able to do things and they measured his brain and, then, and uh, he can do things that normal people can't do. He, he ran to the tops of mountains and just wearing shorts where it's supposed to be freezing. People don't know how he does it. That's kind he, of he, te he teaches here. He teaches here. Yeah, I kind of heard. Oh, it's like meditation. Yeah, I kind of heard something similar. I saw a little thing on Facebook where uh, there was this monk that trained his mind to not feel severe heat because he was sitting in this pot, you know, and the water was boiling. You could see the fire going up, and yet it wasn't harming him. It sort of reminded me of like those Bugs Bunny cartoons where they're in the, the stewing pot or whatever. But I just thought that that was pretty fascinating, you know, that he could he could get in a state where he wouldn't feel the pain from the extreme heat. That sounds similar to what you're talking about. That's the kind of things I've been practicing. And I mean, it'll work if you, everybody has to go to the dentist and, and you can do it. And it, it'll kind of decrease the pain, too. Mm hmm. How long do you usually meditate for in a day? Normally right now, it's probably only about um, a few minutes, really, to be honest. I um, used to meditate 10 minutes a day. Mm -hmm. I used to do a lot of guided meditations on, on you know, how they have the apps now. Mm -hmm. And those are pretty fun. And, and those are really informative. But um, I kind of like the idea of that one, after some point, you can just um, develop your own relationship with it without a guided meditation yeah i mean i kind of talk about that too because i like recommend guided meditations but i say at some point you don't want to be dependent on the guided meditation because it kind of limits what you can do because you're sort of limited to what they're guiding you into whereas i think meditation mm -hmm. can be more creative than that as you meditate if you can take it yourself and you guide yourself you can go in different directions because you can use meditation for so many different things you can use it for peace and calmness and you can use it essentially to program a more loving kind attitude but you can also get more awareness about yourself you can connect to things like god and whatnot use it as a spiritual practice so there's a lot of creativity you can do you know and i think that sometimes you could use a guided meditation as as a springboard and get ideas from it but then sort of get to the point where you can direct yourself i think is the best you know when when you meditate at some point you know enough that yeah but when you meditate do you feel like you're more aware than when you're just awake you know just normal so what I will try to do as a practice sometimes is to um, stop thinking so much and just become very hyper aware of your in my environment immediately around me, the sound, the sight, and just look at it without, and I know it sounds strange, but you can do this and then just stop thinking so much and just start becoming hyper aware of what's going on around you. And it's very still. Do you have your eyes open or closed when you do that usually? Most meditation, I'll have the eyes closed. Yeah. Um, while I'm talking about those right there, was open them, open you up your eyes and just try to like fully, Eckhart Tolle, and then yeah. try to just fully experience the moment right there. Yeah, because I've noticed about like in terms of awareness, sometimes you can get in a meditative state and be pretty deep and then you can like fill your whole body essentially, virtually almost simultaneously. You know, like you can feel your head, your toes, your fingers. 
you know, everything mm -hmm. on your body. I mean, do you kind of relate to that? That's a Vipassana meditation. A, a, a common one I like to do is, I think you may have heard, it's like the body scan. Mm -hmm. So you just kind of like become aware of your body. You start at the forehead, and you become aware of that, and then you slowly move down your body, you know, become aware of that portion of your body as you go down. And then that's a really, that's the kind of stuff that I am um, do when I, now when I, when I told you I was in the bathtub, you just kind of become this very aware of anything, especially if, if you have any kind of weird ache or pain. Mm -hmm. Do you ever find yourself getting distracted when you're trying to meditate? Oh, like always. A, yeah. And you start thinking about always. what you got to do that day or whatever. What do you, what do you always. usually do to, to sort of get rid of the distractions? or minimize the zen stuff i was taught is just don't forgive yourself don't think about it too much and go back to the the counting of the breath whatever it is you're doing i think it's a focus meditation which is a lot of them let's go back to the focus and um every time you drift away which will happen they're called the monkey mind and all that they, they go right mm -hmm. back and does that usually always work for you or? Yeah, you get better and better at it the more you practice with it. But it's always, it's never, I mean, sometimes I have moments where I don't have total still mind mm -hmm. and a totally clear mind, but no, most of the time it's trying, my mind, I like to observe my mind. I started thinking after a while, you know, about watching my mind operate. And it spends a lot of its time trying to solve problems a lot, almost too much. Like it's kind of it's stuck in the habit of always trying to solve problems that causes a little bit of stress for me. That's my own personal observation lately. You're, maybe you, yeah. you might be able to relate that we spend our day so much trying to solve problems that it can't, it doesn't stop trying to solve problems, even though you just need to relax now and sit down. Yeah. It, the day is done. You, well, you don't need to, but your brain is carrying stress of trying to solve problems. Yeah, because I think a lot of people think, well, in terms of distractions, like, oh, I'm thinking about negative things, like I'm thinking about I got to pay bills or I've got this obligation or that. But it, positive things can be just as much of a distraction, like you're, you know, you're, you're doing well at your work or you've got this idea for a project and it's a positive thing, but it's distracting you from being able to meditate and you're taking it in your time. That can be just as much of a distraction as something that's negative. You know, so you try to, to take out everything and just leave it at the door, so to speak, when you're meditating, you know? Yeah. Oh, I should probably, I was thinking, <clears throat> excuse me, I should probably mention a little bit of, I, of some classes. I took a lot of classes, you know, meditation, lots of intro. I had to think about it. I um, took in uh, 20 years ago, I took a shamanic journeying course with Dr. Hank Wesselman. Um, that was an interesting experience. So it's kind of like you're going into a dream state and you start, it's a meditation kind of, but you put yourself into a dream state where you're seeing things and stuff. And then um, another thing I, I took was, uh, I went to 29 Palms out in the middle of California. There is a kind of like a Vipassana Buddhist kind of uh, almost like a monastery out there. Mm -hmm. And I was out there for a week. And so I, when you sign up, you can't speak to anybody or even look at anybody for a week. It's like very, you, know, where you kind of take a vow of silence and you meditate 12 hours a day and you go through these instructions and you have a teacher. The only person you allowed to talk to a teacher. That was an intense experience. I did that. I learned a lot from that. Um, I became really body aware. I mean, at the end of that experience, I was able to um, focus in on every vertebrae of my back. And actually, I think I can focus in on it and kind of like make the muscles around it flex right, around each one. Yeah. And I don't know, is that, I've never really studied about it too much, but it sounds kind of similar to like a, a therapy called biofeedback. I think they go in there and they try to focus on whatever part of their body is, and then they try to relieve the tension and things like that and heal it. I don't know much about biofeedback, but I think it's something like that, isn't it? 
Do you know much about biofeedback? I a little bit because my um, I know other people who I know somebody who has that headband to measure brain waves, and people now their technology is cheap enough and and advanced enough that people can buy these things at home now and hook them up to their phones and start reading their own brains and what it looks like when you're meditating and start doing your own kind of research almost. Um, yeah, I heard about something like that too, where you can scan and see what your brain is doing at a particular time after your meditation. It'll keep a record. And, and I, maybe some of me, while you're meditating, it'll tell you like kind of where your brain is. It'll give you signals or something, you know. But when you go into the a dreamlike state, um, is that, have you ever went into that dreamlike state that that, uh, that meditation teacher was talking about? Yes, so that was part of it, and he had taught us to do that. That was um, 25 years ago, but I do remember that. It was, it was strange because you were trying to contact other spirits, and so it was, it was, it was different. I was trying to talk, contact animal spirits. Um, every, me and the others who were taking the class um, stopped practicing that style because we started having unusual experiences and seeing actual animals and spirits and trees and things during daily life and so it became so unusual and unsettling i saw actual cats following me around because i was having some kind of relationship with some kind of cat spirits or something it was so unusual that we had to stop but i mean yeah. i should write about that some days and it was a long time ago it was really weird hmm. yeah it's like have you ever had that um you know because you meditate um, you're, you're about to wake up in the morning and, but you're, you're not fully awake, but you're still kind of sleepy. You'll kind of play with it a little bit and you can have like, uh, lucid dreams to some extent and sort of like control, like, okay, I'd like to see this scenery and that scenery and things like that. And it's, it's kind of similar to meditation, you yes. know, early in the morning. Have you done That's any of it. that? So that was the kind of thing that you're talking about you enter that state where you get so relaxed mm -hmm. and that's yeah that was kind of what we're doing that's kind of what i'm sorry that's just what we were doing oh yeah i mean that was um that was a, that was a long time ago with the shamanic journeying what we would do is we would listen to a simple drum beat on our headphones and then we'd go boom, 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 boom. You know, they have studies that show that when people hear a drum beat like that, it does change your brainwaves. Mm -hmm. And so we would do that and we would enter these type, teach ourselves to go into these types of like trances. Hmm. And it was, it was based on like sh shamanism from indigenous cultures. Mm-hmm. That sounds pretty interesting. So, okay, well, he, he wrote some books called, um, his, his name is Dr. Hank Wesselman. And mm -hmm. he wrote some books about his experiences where he was um, in contact with his future self 5,000 years in the future. Huh. This is, I know it's an unusual, yeah. very unusual experience. But we're going into different perspectives of reality. So we started going into indigenous religions. For example, when um, you and I met well, met a long time ago, we lived out in the Mojave Desert and the uh, Navajo, some of the Navajo and other, other people believe in different perspectives of reality that's very different than what we would think of. And maybe humanoids and animals that we don't believe exist. But it sounds kind of like, um, you know, like Native Americans, when they need to get some some wisdom, they'll go out and have a uh, like a vision quest or something like that, you know, mm -hmm. and then they'll go. I think they get in meditative states and, you know, they uh, get visions and come back with wisdom about certain things. It's kind of like that, isn't it? Yes. Yes. That was what, and then the idea was the shaman would do this regularly for people and would 
we was able to perform certain things and be able to do kinds of healings too. So they had their idea of how they would heal and you can, you can find, find someone in, in I, I could find someone here in Sacramento, California, probably heal in that way. So shamanic healing where they, they believe that that of somebody is hurting, like saying their shoulder is hurting or something. It might be actually a kind of like something that is, um, alive inside of them and needs to be taken out somehow. Hmm. Yeah. Like I, a spider spirit is stuck inside of them. Yeah. Well, and I kind of wonder, like, if you just even talk at a more basic level, like if you have a lot of pain and then you meditate, can it sort of release a euphoria where you're kind of getting an endorphin release that helps you feel better too? You know, I mean, just at a more basic level. Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, I, it fascinates me the, the, trying to use this as a kind of medicine and to be able to calm yourself and or control yourself. And that's something that fascinates me because I do have insomnia. So sometimes I can try to like, there's different practices you can try to do to calm yourself. Just, you know, just focusing on the breath. I, I keep it simple. I've done a lot of fancy stuff in the past and Mm -hmm. I think it's best just to keep it simple. Just follow your breath. Just, just lay there and, fall, and just watch your breath and count it a little bit. And do you sort of get like a, after you meditate for the rest of the day or several hours after, do you feel like a kind of euphoria or sense of well-being as a result of meditating? Because I sort of get that a lot. And that's one of the things I really enjoy. I get about more. Meditating. Well, I, I get kind of well-being. And I get a um, more balanced feeling. I'm less able to be kind of pushed or have my buttons pushed, so to speak. I'm more, um, a little more like stronger, my balance, psychological balance, I guess you might say. Mm -hmm. um, you, when you talk about euphoria, so, I mean, um, I don't know. I do feel sometimes you can, you can do that. Like if you're out in a nice area, in a nice park or something, and you want to like feel good, you can kind of like, you can do that where you're just kind of watching the grass and kind of enter that state. Mm -hmm. I mean, does it sort of give you more energy too? Because like a lot of times I meditate generally in the afternoon and I feel more energetic after I meditate. You know, because it, it's like the ultimate pick me up because nothing seems to energize me as much as when I meditate for me personally. Okay. Yeah. I have, I have heard of that. I've had um, people hurt, people who are able to go pretty further doing that. So you can use this stuff in sports, sports psychology. You can use this stuff to kind of go the extra mile. You can do things like that. Yeah. Um, oh, I might, you mentioned something earlier about lucid dreaming. So during this period when I was eight years old, my mother had taught, taught me how to do a lucid dream. And that night I had a lucid dream where I was floating over like a, a pirate's table. I was eight years old. And, I kind of, mm -hmm. and it scared the pirates and the pirates ran away. And ever since then, I always had the little bit of power, to, I guess power, the ability to kind of lo well, lucid dream. And once I lucid dream, then you can, I can um, have um, kind of power and influence over my environment. Not as much as the stories I hear from other people, they can fly and take a so I can just, all I can do is levitate mm -hmm. and I can move like objects around using my mind. Mm -hmm. And I can levitate, I'm, I'm kind of float up to a certain point. I can evade enemies and stuff like that, but I can't full on fly. I can't do a lot of things. But if I become lucid dreaming, um, I, I don't. I can um get away from the enemy. I, I don't know. I haven't done that. Been able to do that so much lately. But I, when I was younger, and up and throughout my teens, and still sometimes I can, I'll just remember oh, I'm dreaming, and then I can um. Your whole mindset changes on things. You know, then you, you, it can't really hurt you. The monster can't hurt you. You can turn around and face it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've done that with, with lucid dreaming too. You know, like 
I always had these dreams where I'm lost and I'm trying to find something. And then I realized one time in a dream that it was the same repeating pattern. And I went and looked in a mirror and then I smiled and then I, I woke up and it was like, I haven't had as much problem with those I'm lost dreams anymore. You know, after that experience, I've had other lucid dreams, you know, like visitation dreams after someone passed and it would feel as real as when you're awake, you know, but you knew you were dreaming and you knew the person had passed, but yet it feels as real as being wide awake. Have you ever had that kind of lucid dreaming? No, in a long time, I'm afraid. That's pretty intense. I like that. But uh, I haven't had visitations like that. Um, not a long time. I know that if I, if, you, if, if I wanted to get into dreaming again, I used to carry dream journals and things like that, that the closer you get to it, the more you can get into it. And I had some unusual experiences with lucid dreaming where you, I would try to ask the people, are you real? They get kind of offended. Of course, I'm real, but, but and I explained it. But I'm in a dream, so that means you're not real. You're not dreaming. They seem very offended. Yeah. That's not true. And um, I've had some uh, interesting experiences. One time, I, I, I when I was lucid dreaming, I asked. Um, I was just hanging out with someone. I was a teenager, I was hanging out with another teenager in this dream in this house, and I I told her, I, I think I'm dreaming. I'm dreaming now. And then she turns to me, well, of course you are. You're the rainbow person. <laughs> I just wake up. And it's kind of unusual that I've had experiences. When, you, um, when I was a teenager, I used to kind of mess with this stuff and try to, like, go into lucid dream and then try to question the people in the dream, what's happening, what's going on, once you become aware. And they have unusual experience. They'll turn to you and say things, unusual things, like, yeah, of course this is a dream. And they say unusual things to you. Yeah. So I never figured out the dream world. The whole, that's a whole other show, I suppose. The dream <laughs> yeah. world. Yeah. It's so unusual. Well, it seems like meditation. Because it isn't like the figments of your imagination that mm -hmm. you don't go up there, you know? Yeah. It seems like meditation can touch on so many different other things, you know, because, well, it's a lot like hypnosis or it's a lot like yoga or it's a lot like certain other experiences, lucid dreaming. And then people, people can use meditation for so many different things just from basic stress relief and feeling more peace to, you know, spiritual experiences to, you know, having more wisdom and intuition, healing the body. Seems like there's always new things to experience or to learn in meditation. Yeah, well, what's happening with the, the science, they're discovering how all of it just now, how this is all real. They used to kind of laugh 20 or 30 years ago, all the doctors and everybody, we used to laugh at meditation. I remember when I was into it 20, 30 years ago, and you kind of didn't want to talk about it too much because people would kind of roll their eyes or something like it wasn't really told. You told a doctor about meditation and it being helpful. And then they, they just kind of roll their eyes, you know, oh boy. <laughs> and now it's a scientific fact. All the doctors have to say, oh, it's real. Yeah. And uh, I think it goes further, way further than that, than what, we, we just kind of hit the tip of the iceberg of this. This is a new technology that we can use to help ourselves. Like what were the things that we're talking about? Going through scary experiences, mm -hmm. you can kind of calm yourself. Yeah, and I think, I mean, like I still have people that, you know, kind of think, well, you know, this meditation is just nothing but a nap. <laughs> you know, they think you're taking a little nap or something. And it's like, well, it's a lot different and it's more than whatever you get from a nap you know but yeah i know well i mean it, it's happening so people it's it's coming so what do you what do you ultimately want to do with meditation is there certain goals like do you want to teach meditation do you want to write about it is there something you want to do with meditation and other people to bring the message of meditation? I might do that someday in the future. I have um, been through a lot of classes and stuff to be able to maybe do something like that. But um, 
I'm just fascinated right now. I want to continue on what, what, I'm, what I'm doing. Um, <clears throat> look for more meditation groups and Right now, I'm mostly into the therapy, into the healing of it. When we talk about like spiritual things, when I when I was younger, I was into. I still kind of am uh, when it comes to, to um, being spiritual. I do um, use it as a kind. We talk, we talk about being spiritual now today. I use it as kind of part of a prayer exercise. Maybe I guess after praying, I will often like to meditate and kind of like, um, and it will work if and if I pray. And then um, almost wait for a message, especially if it's something kind of like my, I'm scared or whatever. And you can pray and then to start meditating. And within a few minutes, you know, mm -hmm. beyond your understanding, you know, yeah. just be fine. You'll feel, you, somehow you'll be okay. And you'll be kind of like, oh, that's kind of neato. That can actually work. Yeah, I mean, there's a connection between prayer and meditation. And it's always kind of difficult to see because there's some types of praying that are like meditation. There's like a contemplative prayer that someone I know does that and was talking about it. It sounds similar to meditation. And, you know, a lot of people think of praying as you're asking God for something, meditating, you're kind of listening for answers and feeling his awareness in you or something. So they're kind of connected. They're like yeah. two sides of the same coin. Um, have you ever used meditation, you know, to gain wisdom from God? Like you had certain issues or questions about life and what is it all about and use meditation for deeper wisdom? Well, yeah, when I used to live out in near Zion National Park, mm -hmm. I used to um, hike out there and I would do practices where I'd go out in the desert by myself and just kind of meditate all day by myself. And it'd be my own like little personal vision quest, sort of. Mm -hmm. And I didn't get always necessarily any kind of big sentences or orders or anything clear more than I would learn to um, just have a real peace in the situation and learn how to practice that. Um, an example is one time I got lost in a North Rim Grand Canyon, the, the Kayabab Forest. I got lost mm -hmm. out there once, it was scary. And um, I had to sleep outside in the forest in the morning when I could see it, finally see the forest floor. And it was kind of scary because I, I had no idea where I was in the middle of the forest. I had to sleep in the middle of the forest. And as soon as dawn came out, I had to go look for a, a trail to hope I can get back. And I use meditation to try to calm myself, but also just become aware because you can't control the fear at some point. Because I was having fear like, oh, I'm gonna, what if I die? What if, what if I, you know, because you're lost in the forest and then it's a scary experience. What happens if something happens to me? I get hurt. I'm going to die or something. And use meditation to calm yourself and that scary experiences from panicking. And just learn about yourself too, because you can then watch yourself being scared. Watch your mind create fears, and fear thoughts, and, and watch your own reactions from your own fear thoughts. And sometimes you can't control it. You just can't, but you can, but you can learn to separate yourself from from it. So that here's my awareness. And here's this, the fear and whatever it is that's going on, I can learn to like separate it a little bit. I can, I can step back and look at it. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a practice, a spiritual practice, I think, to watch yourself and your fears. That's kind of like a mindfulness. They teach you to sort of step yes. back and, you know, just observe it as a objective observer. Like you feel this way and you don't make any yes. judgments and, you know, you can just observe it. And that sort of takes a lot of the stress away from it. This sort of detaches from it. Yeah. Judgment is almost, again, like I was saying earlier, judgment when you start judging a lot. Unless you're watching the news and you're judging and judging. I, um, so when, when, I, when you start doing that, you, your brain is trying to solve 
problems again, like I was saying earlier. Mm -hmm. And then you get in the habit of solving problems and it causes stress. And judging is trying to solve problems. Part of it. Yeah. Hyper, hyper vigilance, a hyper vigilance, I guess. Mm -hmm. So like, do you ever feel like the voice of God is with you? Because a lot of times I felt it like a separate voice. I'd hear like a separate voice talking to me that was, I perceived as God. And then they came to a point, probably like a few years ago, to where I didn't hear like a separate voice. I just heard it from within me. And I kind of figured, well, maybe I don't really need to have a separate voice over here. I can just know that there's a divine aspect within me that's connected to the larger part of God anyway. So I don't need to have it over here. I just have it within my, my being itself. You know, so I perceive it different. Do you, do you kind of relate to any of that? Like I was saying earlier, when, with the prayer, mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll have the prayer, and sometimes, and then uh, after the meditation, right after, I will just kind of like um, have those types of experiences where I will just allow um, the God to just come in, and with the Holy Spirit, just come in and just do whatever, and. Like, like, like they say, it's beyond your understanding. And I can have some in, really, in, I do have some very interesting experiences that are pleasurable. I kind of feel like this something, all this pain and all this stuff dissolving and having experiences like that inside of me emotionally. It's mm -hmm. kind of, it's really fascinating. It feels good. So yeah. when you talk about that, I will have experiences where I just suddenly, I just, uh, it's hard to explain. Just, um, the problems seem to dissolve the way I suppose. And so, like, are you coming at it from a particular religious or spiritual perspective? Because you talked about learning from Buddhist teachers, and you mentioned, like, the Holy Spirit. Are you coming at it from, like, uh, a Christian or a Buddhist or just sort of? I was, I was taught mostly kind of Buddhist most of my life, a kind of Buddhist meditation, mostly a Zen, mm -hmm. um, maybe some others. And I, when I was younger, I read a lot of um buddhist and eastern philosophy books i was really influenced by that um but when now i, I, I uh more probably more christian you now mm -hmm. where the buddhism is a technology mm -hmm. and the practices and exercises are a technology that i use mm -hmm. yeah and of Bo from buddhism buddhism yeah. is kind of like a a technology for me often yeah and i think a lot of people may not realize that virtually all religions um at some level have meditated meditation or meditative practices you know there's there's christians that meditate there's uh, jewish groups there's buddhists of course and hindus and different things so it's not exclusive to one particular religion because a lot of people almost exclusively associated with buddhism but there's a lot of different religious traditions that incorporate meditation as a spiritual practice yeah we had that in the west too we just called it different things mm -hmm. stoicism i've often people often say the ancient what was it the ancient roman or ancient greek stoicism is often people say it's like buddhism Mm -hmm. I didn't study myself personally, but that's what I heard. Yeah. And like I, I've pointed out in, in the Bible, there's different verses that talk about meditating on your bed and meditate on certain things, you know, that are good and true. Yes. And of course, obviously the Bible doesn't really get into detail about <laughs> what that is. It's It's a focus, but it doesn't give you a lot of detail in terms of how do you meditate on it? Whereas maybe Buddhism has more of a formalized approach to how meditation is yes, done. It is. You know? So it it is more formal. Yeah, it is more formalized. And when um in the Bible though, it's in there when you talk about be still and know that I am. Mm -hmm. And it does it starts to and um think about me with in the dawn or before dawn. And that time before dawn is a uh, quiet time. 
and that um, there's other things inside the Bible that does point at mm -hmm. guard your own thoughts. So now it's telling you know, Jesus and other people talk about going into your mind and becoming aware of the things inside your mind is, is telling you to do that. It's not giving you all step-by-step -step instructions, but he just says, let's do that. Just guard your own mind. And it depends on the interpretation, but you kind of imprison the bad thoughts. Mm -hmm. You know, you know which, what I'm saying about? Yeah. Yeah. I know what you're saying. Yeah, so it yeah, sounds like yeah. you have a pretty diverse background and you understand a lot about meditation to where you could take it and write books or teach courses, whether online or in person. And, you know, you could hold some, you could hold Zoom seminars and different things. There's all different kinds of things you can do with online teaching now. I don't, you know, that you could take the meditation and what you've learned and share it with people. Yeah, I could do that. I mean, I might do that. If I was to do something like that, I'd really keep it simple. And you don't have to be complicated. I have, I th I have thoughts about that. I'm not sure what I would do yet with that. But I've been in classes like that you're talking about. That's where I learned a lot of it. Mm-hmm. So is there anything else you'd uh, like to share as we close out that you've learned from meditation? I think, no, <laughs> actually, I mean, <laughs> it's a big subject for me. And so honestly, I should, maybe I should have wrote, written down what it is because my whole past with it is so long that I kind of forgot maybe a lot of interesting things like, you know, I, I brought the monastery experience. That was a week, and that was very intense. I, um, I'm sure there's a lot of experiences I actually forgot. But I'm glad to talk about this. Yeah. And, and, I, and I just want to do that. So do you have any social media sites you'd like that people could connect to you with? Um, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. I have a Facebook. It's Troy Far. You can you can go there. Um, right now, I'm into video art, but I'm interested in that. I personally, I mean, I just kind of on my own personal practice, I just kind of go on somebody else's site, which is like the the Calm Well on YouTube, mm -hmm. and. Um, can I use their stuff? Um, that's it right now, though. I haven't really thought it about. I might do. I might do some class. I'm kind of fascinated with what would happen if we would do use technology to keep expanding what, what's going on. So not just simply to have our own like sensors and to know what our brain waves are at, but then to be able to go online for a zoom, like something like a Zoom like this. What if we got a like, hundred people to do a, a a giant meditation group? What what would that be like? Yeah, and could, um, yeah, I thought about doing that too. You know, like we could co co host one or whatever. You know. When you have a group of meditation, it has an effect sometimes of it being stronger. If you just have five or just two meditators, but yeah, like five people meditating in a room together, it somehow it kind of makes it, it creates a different environment where it can be more stronger. I heard stories of people getting together in large groups and focusing on something, and it became I mean, quite interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that sounds good. Um, I guess we can just go ahead and close it out now. So yeah, thanks for okay. having me on your show. And I'll just stop it.